So good morning, everybody. My name is Susan Moffitt, and on behalf of myself and Lisa Wymore, I would like to welcome you all to Arts and Design Fridays, Landscapes of Migration, Incarceration, and Resistance. Um, and I want to welcome our public audience, both in person uh, and on Zoom, as well as our students. And before we launch into our conversation with Lenora Lee and Ava Roy, um, I'd like to take care of just a little bit of housekeeping to do with our course, because this is also the course called Humanities 20. Um, uh, so first, I'd like to introduce students uh, to Lauren Chang and Adiola Kofuabayomi, and they can come up here and say a few words. Uh, these folks are very important to this class, and they have a lot of answers. So I get a lot of questions, and uh, I just want to uh, let you know that you can ask them of uh, Lauren and Adiola. So here they go. Hey, everyone. I'm Lauren. I use she, her pronouns. I am one of the readers for this class. Hi, I'm Adiola. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the second reader for this class. Um, yeah, so... Um, Basically, we're the ones like grading your stuff. Um, do you want to talk about the FAQs? Sure. Okay. So, um, <laughs> okay. So, like Lauren said, we're the one we're the one marking attendance and grading your scores. So, if you have any questions about that, you have to email Lauren and I and with CC Susan so that we can answer all your questions. And then, if you're late or you have any extenuation circumstances, you need to reach out to us promptly so like we can evaluate your circumstances. Thank you. Yeah, and something else we did was we also set up like a class Discord. So I know some of y'all joined it. Uh, I recommend joining it because if you want to communicate with each other, um, Susan also posts some great announcements in there about upcoming uh, events or just very cool things going on. So I recommend joining that. You can also coordinate with each other, like um, traveling on BART together for the uh, Angel I for the Saturday Angel Island trip, um, and just basically connecting with each other. Um, regarding this class. So you can go ahead and join. I sent the link through uh, B Courses announcement and you just have to message me on Discord to get verified because the bot wasn't working. Um, but yeah, well, thank Great. you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, so these folks can answer all of your logistical questions about attendance and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, please join Discord. It's There's gonna be a lot of great stuff shared on there. Um, so we have our field trip to Angel Island coming up tomorrow, and a lot of you have signed up for that. Um, all of the details um, are um, logistics are in the sign-up form that you signed up on. Um, and if you have any questions, please email me through uh, B Courses, and um, I will answer questions uh, later this afternoon. So feel free to ask any questions you have. Uh, Two main points, be on time, don't miss the boat, um, and bring food and water. It'll be a really great field trip. Um, for folks who can't make the field trip tomorrow, uh, we have another field trip scheduled for September 24th, but that is open, as we announced earlier, to all of the affiliated classes in a year on Angel Island, so that is full. However, uh, you can still sign up to be on the wait list, and we're planning another um, uh, field trip for October. And all of this, we will be announcing signups very soon. And uh, because a couple of folks ha had family emergencies, we have a couple of slots open for tomorrow. So if uh, you want to go tomorrow, you still can uh, email me before 4 p.m. today if you're interested, and we'll put you on the list. Um, so that's the field trips. I also want to remind folks that this is the last weekend of Lenora Lee's performance of In the Movement. And as I mentioned before, with some extra funding, we've been able to subsidize tickets so that uh, you can attend for free. Uh, information on how to do that is both in the announcements and also in the assignment uh, for the uh, dance uh, uh, exploration. Um, and I want to remind students that next week is Ed Tepporn from the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. That is the one speaker who is uh, required because it's going to be a really great foundational history of Angel Island and the activism that led to the preservation of the immigration station. Um, so uh, please come to that. It's going to be a really great talk. And if you have friends who are interested in the history of Angel Island, that's also a really uh, great lecture for them to attend. 
Okay, so now we'll, we will uh, move on to the main event. Uh, we're so pleased to have Lenora Lee and uh, Ava Roy with us here today. Um, and I want to welcome our public audience. Uh, and I know some of you may be here because you're fans of Ava or Lenora, and you may not be familiar with our whole uh, project called A Year on Angel Island. It's a year at UC Ber Berkeley of programming, exhibitions, performances, courses, public lectures, and creative projects looking at issues of immigration, othering, and belonging. And we have many public events and a great speaker series of which this is one part. I invite you to look at futurehistories.berkeley.edu and uh, everything is listed there and you can also sign up for our, our newsletter if you like. Um, uh, I'd like to start our session today by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Ohlone people, the area known as Huchin, and also that the land that we are studying, Angel Island, is the territory of the Coast Miwok people. And as I say each time, it's really important that we don't just uh, give a land acknowledgement and move on and think we're done. I encourage everybody both to learn more about the indigenous peoples of uh, the Bay Area um, and also to think not just of history, but also of supporting futures uh, that support a more sovereign and thriving future uh, for these members of our community. And in particular, uh, if anyone was not here last week when we had uh, Greg Saris, who is a leader of the Coast P uh, Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people, that is, he's a, a leader of the uh, people in whose territory Angel Island lies. That talk, uh, which was a wonderful conversation with Professor Beth Piatote, that will be uh, posted very soon, the video of that on the website of uh, Future Histories. Um, so uh, before I introduce Ava and uh, um, Lenora, I just want to frame our conversation uh, geographically. Uh, earlier this semester, I showed some pictures of Alcatraz and Angel Island next to each other. Um, and they are, of course, both places from which we can observe really uh, broad histories of Pacific flows of, of labor and uh, trade um, and culture, and from which we can look east to the extractive industries of the gold rush um, in industrial agriculture in the middle of California. Um, but it's also to think about them, uh, it's also helpful to think about them as places of incarceration. Alcatraz uh, was designed as a place uh, for criminals, Angel Island's incarceration uh, barracks were designed for immigrants, um, mostly from Asia. They also um, are places of activism. And so the history of these places in the late 60s and early 70s is really interesting to compare because Alcatraz was occupied uh, by American Indians in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, 1969 through 71. There was a 19 month occupation of Alcatraz Island uh, by Native Americans who were claiming it under uh, a treaty uh, that a 19th century treaty that said that unused uh, federal land uh, should be uh, re uh, returned to Native Americans. And on that basis, they occupied the space. Um, and it was a very important watershed in Native American activism uh, in the United States. And at the same time, that is just when activism around saving the immigration station at Angel Island was happening. That is when the poetry carved into the walls of the abandoned detention center uh, by the Chinese immigrants was discovered. And it, it's the time when uh, Asian Americans worked together to prevent the demolition of the immigration station. That building was slated to be demolished and its history erased. Uh, and they were working at the same time as the Native Americans were working um, to assert um, their, their right to exist and their right to tell stories uh, through place. So um, these are, uh, that's one aspect of these uh, two islands that I hope we'll be thinking about today. Um, secondly, uh, our second theme today, since this is a course on explorations in art and design, we're going to be thinking about the way that dance and theater can help us understand place, um, understand history, and help us think about the future. And uh, today we're going to be learning about theater and dance uh, that takes place 
uh, not uh, just in a theater. And I'm curious um, of the folks here today, how many of you have been to a theater or a dance performance that is not in a theater, but that is um, outdoors um, in, in some kind of site-specific location? Quite a few. That's great. So I think you'll, you'll enjoy uh, hearing these makers of, of that kind of theater talk about how they develop their work and how they think about it. Um, so now I'm going to introduce both Lenora and Ava, and then uh, after we'll just have them each talk in turn, uh, then uh, we'll have a short conversation among them and me, and then we'll open it up for questions before the end of class. So Lenora Lee is artistic director of Lenora Lee Dance, and she's a dancer, choreographer, and artistic director who presents large-scale multimedia performance works that integrate dance, music, video production, projection, and text. And they connect various styles of movement and music to culture, history, and human rights issues. She's been an artist fellow at the de Young Museum, a Jurassic resident artist and a visiting scholar at the New York University through the Asian Pacific and American Institute and an artist in residence at Dance Mission Theater. Her work is often based on deep research and interviews with people who have experienced detention, incarceration, and other hardships. And she engages sites that both illuminate and are illuminated by the bodies moving in them. Uh, her current production, In the Movement at ODC in San Francisco, has its last few days this weekend, and I strongly encourage everyone to attend. Ava Roy is the founding artistic director of We Players and is dedicated to transforming public spaces into realms of immersive theater. She has pioneered unique partnerships with both the National Park Service and the California State Park System, creating large-scale performances at park sites throughout the Bay Area. Her work is deeply inspired by the entrenched histories, communities, and energies of each site, as well as the natural environment. Roy earned her BA at Stanford University, and in addition to her performance work, she's a yoga teacher and a sailor. Uh, just a few of her many productions include Macbeth at Fort Point at the southern end of the Golden Gate Bridge, a politically relevant version of Julius Caesar at Golden Gate Park, and my sentimental favorite, The Tempest at the Albany Bulb on San Francisco Bay. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Lenora Lee uh, and Ava Roy. Hi, everyone. How are you this morning? Yeah. It's really lovely to be here. I just wanted to thank you for the introduction. Um, and I wanted to just give a little bit of background on who I am. I grew up in San Francisco um, and was heavily involved with the uh, Asian American communities and uh, the Chinese American community there. And grew up in different um, programs that fostered uh, leadership and community building uh, collaboration. And through my dance training at UCLA, I received a, a bachelor's at UCLA and was really encouraged by my mentors and professors there, as well as a saxophonist collaborator, Francis Wong, to integrate um, stories about the communities either that I've been a part of or um, com communities that um, uh, I'd like to share or do research on. And so that's been a part of the work that I've been doing throughout um, my years as an artist. And so the projects are very much research driven. And um, today I'm going to detail a little bit about the project that we set on Angel Island in the at the US immigration station there. It's called Within These Walls. Um, who here has heard of the Chinese Exclusion Act? Yes. So uh, my grandparents, all four of them immigrated to the United States during the exclusion era, and all four of them came over under false names, um, false identities. And during this period of time between 1882 and 1943, because the US was trying to limit the number of laborers coming over, um, there was great scrutiny <laughs> um, uh, and specifically on Angel Island at the immigration station between 1910 and 1940. And this piece was dedicated to those who were uh, detained, interrogated, and processed there. And oftentimes they were held for much longer periods than other immigrants. And um, they were asked hundreds of questions, uh, packed in 
you know, into a room where it may comfortably or supposedly fit 60 people. There were 180 people um, that had to live together. So I wanted to show a short video clip of that in addition to two other recent pieces. One is uh, a project that I did in 2019 after I found out my, that my sister had stage four breast cancer. So I interviewed about 32 people who either had some form of cancer or whose family members had cancer. And we set that uh, at Dance Mission Theater. We integrated um, aerial dancing in that. And I'm also going to share a short video clip of a piece that we did in 2018 um, that we collaborated with uh, the Chinatown YMCA for, and we set it inside their swimming pool. So that piece is based on uh, a story of incarceration. I'm just going to share that with you now. And then I'll talk a little bit more in detail about um, the Angel Island Project.
Um, so, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we've uh, been able to build a nice relationship as well with the California State Parks and the National Park Service. And throughout my time as an artist, I've always been fascinated and very interested in working outside of the theater and taking a look at historic locations um, and being able to understand a little bit about the history, what occurred over time in those spaces, as well as um, to integrate historical research with things that are happening current day. And our approach has been multidisciplinary and in integrating a lot of uh, video and film footage, which adds another layer of narrative to the process. Um, in addition to having interviewees voices featured in the projects, working with poets and playwrights, and um, I've been working with the same composers and, and um, creative musicians as well, Francis Wong and Tatsu Aoki, who's based in Chicago. Um, so for the our Angel Island project, we built it inside the station, and there. I don't know if you're you're going about to go on to um, the field trip and. Um, it's quite moving stepping into that space and understanding and getting an energetic sense of the history there, reading the poems on the walls. There's over 200 poems that are car carved on the walls by the Chinese who were detained for such long periods um, that they uh, felt compelled to write about their experiences on the walls. And so um, uh, the the projects that we've been doing are are multi-layered in that way and in hopes to bring out the stories and the history of, of various different populations. I am going to um, move around to talk about this current project that we're performing right now because at the time, the last few years that we did uh, within these walls at the immigration station, we first had it there in 2017 and then felt it was so important we wanted to bring it back. So we did in 2019 along with a sequel. Around that time, I, f I was curious to uh, dive deeper into research on what's currently happening in terms of immigration issues in the United States. And that's how um, I had the opportunity to create the piece that is per being performed right now. So I wanted to actually play a, a short video, actual audio excerpt from the piece and move with you all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to mirror me, which is if I hold up my right hand like this, then you would hold up your left hand. And as I move, we're going to try to stay together in unison. So let's just do, so for example, this is my left hand. If I'm holding up my left hand, you would hold up your right hand, yep. So we're a mirror image of each other. As I play the first couple of minutes of this audio, we're going to do this together, okay? And then when I go like this, then you're gonna fade out and I'll keep going, okay? All right. My name is Rumini Hong. My brother had been out of jail for 12 years. He was born in Cambodia, but he grew up out here. This has been his home uh, since he was like five years old, five or six years old. He got caught up in some things and uh, went to jail. That made him deportable. His, his crime made him deportable. Um, and so he'd been living with that for 12 years, um, knowing that he, you know, if the United States said it's time to go, and then, you know, that, that's what he'd been dealing with for, for, for 12 years. He told me that he got a letter. He sent me what it, he, sent, he sent me a photo of it. And it basically said that he had what was it like two weeks to turn to to basically turn himself into ice for deportation we realized that it was a raid on bay area Cambodian communities and this is something that the community has been dealing with for the past 20 years um deportation started in the early 2000s for for Cambodian communities anyways which was a really big deal because we came here as refugees um this is a community that has grown up here 
largely grown up here. This is the only home that they've ever known, was brought here due to what the U.S. did in Southeast Asia and is now facing deportation. The months after that was a series of campaigning for individuals. It was a series of in-person actions um, that took place in the Bay Area and in Sacramento. By the end of it, we actually got uh, up and down the state for that particular raid. I think there was 11 people that we um, had prevented their deportations, either by delaying whatever process they were at, or some people got pardons and some people got their convictions vacated. My brother was one of those that got his conviction vacated, and so he is able to stay, um, and he's been here and be safe from deportation. These people who are coming out of prison, they're coming out because they've been paroled, right? Or they've, ser they've served their time in the state. The county has deemed them um, like ready to, to come back into society. Your community right here are, already feels like, like you're ready to come back and be with, your, be with your people, be with your family, be in your community. Then it's senseless the fact that, you know, ICE exists to still break up these families in this way, especially since people have already been doing decades um, at times in in jail, in prison, being incarcerated, um, have turned have turned their life around. Everybody that I know that I've met through Roots, through APSC, are amazing individuals, and they should have the opportunity and the chance to, you know, show the world I'm not my mistake. Um, I'm not what I did. I think that especially given the time that a lot of these mistakes were made, it's the time that a lot of young people make mistakes when you're coming into uh, your teen years. But not only that, like when you're coming into your teen years after your parents, after you've seen your parents, or maybe even you remember some of the horrific events that have taken place in your early life, when you've gone through war, when you've seen genocide, and you come here to a completely new place, unfamiliar with the language, no mental health services, Services after seeing something like that. No translation services readily available. How do you expect a family to thrive in that type of environment? People are going to, you know, make it make sense for themselves. People are going to fill in the blanks and try to do whatever they can so that they can survive. Sometimes it's not always the best decisions. And and that's what, you know, as a society, as a society, I guess we've decided that incarceration was going to be the answer. But then if they're going to be released and then you're going to deport them anyways, then, then how is that the answer? Like, it did not do, you know, this is not a system that works. If this is something that, um, if, if you're still going to continue to disrupt people's lives, in this way. It's just a continuation of like the atrocities of war and greed. Yeah, I just wanted to share that because I feel like we're in the thick of it right now doing this show and having the interviewees be present and also share during the panel discussions about these things that are happening currently that are unmistakable and how deeply affected these communities have been. Um, this feels very critical and important. Um, So I did want to say that while there is a lot of information for this particular project that shared um, the narratives and the details involved uh, in their experiences are uh, very generously shared with all of us and I hope that you all can make it to the show <laughs> tonight through Sunday. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have left. How do you feel? I could show um, one or two minutes of video, or would you like me to, how do you feel? Keep, keep going or, 
Okay, all right. So we, because of the pandemic, all, a lot of our performance projects were on hold for the last two years. And so this year I had to do three brand new projects. So what I'm gonna do is share with you a little bit, just the cheeser of our Boston project. So we did this piece in April in, uh, in Boston, and it was set in a communities center slash art gallery in Boston's Chinatown. This is just the teaser for it. We lived here until I was 11 years old. We actually lived on this street. We were displaced four times by the time I was six years old. I guess the major trauma for us was the devastation of Chinatown because of urban renewal, and it happened across the country. My life is I want to I want to make change. I want to be a revolutionary, and I decided I can't ever be a whole person until Asian American people are no longer suffering from oppression. Yeah, so that part that project is part of a multi-city project that we then did a, a companion piece for um, in June at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. And they both had to deal with um, fighting for affordable housing in Boston's Chinatown, as well as San Francisco's Tenderloin neighborhood. So we dealt with um, communicating with both residents, current and former residents, um, and advocates in the field. And for San Francisco, we talked a lot about um, the housing crisis in the Bay Area. Uh, the unhoused population, growing unhoused population, as well as um, uh, the issues during the pandemic of the growing unhoused population. Um, and so it's it's been fascinating trying to translate these projects into various different spaces and taking into account, say, for example, at the Asian Art Museum, we're talking about the community that lives right outside the Asian Art Museum. You know, the Asian Art Museum is a beautiful building, yet there are so many unhoused people in the neighborhood um, and a lot of, a huge, huge um, immigrant population as well as, uh, folks that are, are living in SROs as well. So um, while it's been, uh, I would have to say that all these projects and pieces have been driven by people's stories and experiences, and that's really the heart of why we are doing what we're doing. You know, somebody said, a good friend said to me, when, when you just step on stage, it's political, because I never felt that I was trying to stand in the form of being an activist. I never felt that about myself. I, but my friend would say, everything is political, which is fascinating. And I think that um, I somewhat embrace the idea now because I feel that we have this opportunity to speak, to really speak through our work. Not, not, not that we didn't before, but this has been um, a critical time for voices to be able to share about what's really going on uh, in various different communities. So that's what's been driving the work here. Thank you so much. Look forward to more. <laughs> so Ava, come on up. Okay. Hi. Lenora, that was so beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay, so coming back from listening, paying attention. My name's Ava. I'm the artistic director of We Players, as Susan introduced. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working in many um, park sites throughout the Bay Area, national park sites, 
uh, California state parks for the past five years with San Francisco Recreation and Parks. Um, so for the most part, the majority of the work that I've made is rather large scale with somewhere between 20 and 40 performers and the audience is on their feet following the actors, musicians and dancers around the performance site. Uh, today I'll focus specifically on the works that I've done on Alcatraz Island between 2009 and 2011 and Angel Island uh, throughout the year of 2012. So that's a while ago now, so I've made other work since then. And if you're interested in finding out more of what we've done uh, or what's coming, you can please visit weplayers.org to see more of what's coming up. But again, I'll just focus on these two islands today, uh, given the context of this, uh, this lecture and discussion. So I've included here just this opening slide, which is our mission statement, um, but it's also an image from Hamlet on Alcatraz, which was an island-wide production we did in 2010. And you can see Hamlet in black in the front uh, and Horatio uh, by his side and a park ranger walking along with us. Um, and uh, those folks in red t-shirts are our wranglers or audience guides. So a lot of times the audience is moving as a very large group um, and we'll have flag bearers or other audience guides uh, who support the audience's experience. At the very least, there is a lead and a caboose so that the slower moving people have some support towards the back uh, and the people in the front have a clear indicator. Um, sometimes they're able to fade away because the actors or musicians or dancers are, are leading and making that clear. Um, the actor that I had play Hamlet, um, her name was Andrus, her name is still Andrus Nichols. Um, I think she goes by Andrus Gates now. Anyway, that's Andrus at the front. Um, and for me, ever since I started We Players in 2000 uh, as an undergraduate uh, in college, um, and even before that, when I had the privilege of growing up performing Shakespeare as a teenager, um, we were never stuck to uh, specific gender roles. So for me, it was not a wild and radical statement to have a woman play Hamlet. It was just, she was the best actor for the job at that time. Uh, when I was 18, I got to play Henry V and uh, rock out with two broadswords. And uh, I was just as equipped to play that role as, and as any of my male counterparts in high school. So for me, that was just part of how I grew up, uh, that Shakespeare is language that belongs to all of us, um, and that uh, it's relevant uh, to anyone, and that the way that I grew up studying Shakespeare and working with Shakespeare was really about building a personal emotional connection to the text, uh, and not figuring out what someone else or what the character should do. The reason we keep performing these works hundreds and hundreds of years later is because there is no final version of any of these plays. They're inexhaustible. There's as many layers of the onion as you can peel back, it keeps going. And I, in my experience, having worked with Shakespeare for 25 years now, um, also the same plays mean different things at different times as I grow and change. Uh, that said, it was rather radical for many of our audience members to encounter a male uh, role or a traditionally male role played by a woman. And for me, uh, sometimes I am casting women to, uh, to in a man's role, but as a woman. And in this case, it was just uh, we maintain those pronouns. And sometimes there's just an entry period where it takes some audience members a few minutes and some of them a long period of time to get over it. And at some point, hopefully, the work is compelling enough that they just start listening to the words and following along. We were in Alcatraz for three years. Uh, from 2009 to 2011. Um, it was some of the first performance work at that time. There was a visual artist, Richard Kamler, who passed away a few years ago, a really incredible, incredible artist, uh, who, to my knowledge, uh, did the first uh, piece on Alcatraz, Table of Voices. And I really recommend you check out his work, especially in context of political activist uh, work uh, and someone who is really important in the Bay Area art scene and who was, uh, again, to my knowledge, the first artist to work on Alcatraz. Um, because I was there for three years, I had some time to develop my practice out there. So the first piece we did was a piece called Iphigenia and Other Daughters, which is a modern retelling of the Oresteia uh, by a playwright, Ella McLaughlin. Um, and this was staged in a somewhat more traditional way. You can see in this image that the audience is seated in chairs facing one direction. Um, that is, uh, when you first get to Alcatraz, you'll see that big building there on the audience's right. 
Um, and this was a piece that uh, the Oresteia is from uh, the ancient Greek canon, um, and it's the first trial by jury in the Western canon, or at least in the Greek canon. Uh, Orestes and Electra are the two children who murder their mother, Clytemnestra, in revenge for her murder of their father, Agamemnon, the curse of the house of Atreus. It's a whole terrible mess. Um, but this piece, this modern retelling, had this alternative ending, uh, that rather than an eye for an eye continuing to make the whole world blind, that in the end of this version, uh, the brother and sister are reunited, and they decide to just put their weapons down and and carve a new path and make a new future forward. So for me, this was a really helpful way to start by looking to the past in the tradition that I have more relationship to, the Greeks and uh, sort of that mythology, um, but to carve an alternative ending. Uh, while the audience was seated in a more traditional setting, I'm still interested in what's happening above us, behind us, below us, and in the distance. So this spotlight that's illuminating uh, the actress who's playing Clytemnestra is actually from the ferry boat that is behind the audience. When the boat takes you out to the island, uh, it comes and goes unless it's the last ferry of the day, in which case it just stays at the dock. And at first it was this terrible problem because there were these loud rumbling engines idling behind us, behind the show. Uh, but for a long time, one of my many mantras that keeps me going is, uh, what's in the way is the way. And that often creates a little tiny crack in through which some new light can get through. And for me, that frustration of the sh ship being there turned into, well, can you at least turn your floodlights onto the stage and help me out with my, um, my limited tech uh, options on the island? So uh, that was great. Um, and then I also try to work with the other factors in the space, whether or not they're um, an issue, namely, in this case, the wind. Uh, and the wind in my work is often another character, and the wind is made visible through fabric. Um, and so I'm often working with that in different ways. These white streamers you see up there, they were bound up in small knots. There's more that you can't see off screen that were bound up in knots. And uh, at a certain key moments in the piece, those uh, knots were unloosed, which is both was both a, a metaphor of the gradual untying and unraveling of the tensions of the play and the movement towards freedom, and then actually activated, animated through the invisible spirit of the wind. It's again a way of working with what are sometimes inhibitions. Some of my actors and audience members uh, tease, not tease, about how freezing cold they always are when they come to a We Players show, because I'm often taking them to edges of the world <laughs> and to places where it's windy and cold and foggy and intense. To me, that's part of the experience. I prefer art that asks you to lean forward in one way or the other, either because it's intensely provocative or because the most basic level of performance, uh, as you also saw in some of Lenora's clips, is that the audience can choose and change their perspective from which they view the show, so they're kinesthetically involved and physically moving. Uh, again, sometimes the wind is brutal and difficult to make things be heard, but it's also an opportunity to make things beautiful beautiful or highlight that. Uh, so I'm only including a couple of those because uh, that was kind of our ramp up into what became an island-wide production of Hamlet uh, throughout the entire island. The show actually started on the boat with um, Hamlet and his best friend Horatio coming back from Wittenberg, and so the audience's first scene was on the boat with the actors, uh, which also means that there were other people on the boat besides our designated audience who were able to bear witness to that scene. And that's a theme throughout a lot of the works that I do where some of the areas we're working in are open to the public, and so the audience might expand and contract during the course of the show as people catch on to what's going on, but then we're often moving into closed areas of a site uh, through which only our designated audience members can go. So every show we usually have some sort of audience signifier. It's different for each project, but it's a way for our audience guides and our actors as well to know who we're taking care of and specifically uh, making sure is with us as we move throughout the space. Uh, this is a nice photo just to give a sense of the scope um, and the way in which um, this incredible visual image of both the distance and proximity of San Francisco, where they took the boat from. Uh, and to me, I'm working a lot in these spaces to uh, 
that the, the choice of location and play uh, is intended to be a kind of alchemical mix that makes more of each, meaning that hopefully you'll get more of a connection and more of a story and more of a thematic relationship to the issues of the site through the pairing of the play and the place, and vice versa, you'll get more out of what Hamlet means because of the setting. So a lot of times I'm not working with a specific layer of history, um, Often I'm working in sites where there are other artists doing that or interpretive rangers who are doing that. So to me, my job is to look for what are the themes that uh, thread across and throughout layers of history and how can we get at multiple layers of history uh, or some of the deeply embedded themes of a site uh, through a piece that will activate those themes while not being specifically about incarceration or specifically about Alcatraz, et cetera. So for me, Hamlet was a way of getting at themes of crime and punishment, choice and consequence, what it means to be free, how to navigate contending um, obligations, in Hamlet's case, moral, filial, uh, his father, the ghost, comes and tells him to kill his uncle. And a lot of times people say, why doesn't he just do it? I mean, you try stabbing your uncle in the back, no matter how awful he is. So I think that, that Hamlet's struggle is also a moral and a personal and a psychological one. While it's easy from the outside to say, why doesn't he just do what his ghost dad tells him to do? Um, so there's uh, a lot of ways in which uh, those tensions, um, and again, those layers of history can be activated by the way and by the space we're in. So here the audience has this opportunity to reflect on their own sense of freedom and that they are relying on that boat to take them back home. And for this time, they are isolated on this island, um, though they've chosen to be there. Here the audience is taking a fairly traditional configuration, uh, but the actors, it's very intimate because even when they take a more traditional configuration, the actors are often moving amongst them or up to them. This is, of course, all pre-COVID work, and so we're also feeding them and touching them and getting very, very close to one another. Uh, the audience is also, as I said, following the actors as they move throughout the island here. They're following Hamlet. As I said, the show started on the boat and then moved up a pretty, it's a pretty significant incline to get up to the parade ground, which is this image back here. Um, and so in order to move the audience along, Hamlet was following the ghost of his father. And in order to make the ghost appear from a half a dozen different locations, we put the actors, about a half a dozen actors, in the same costume. Uh, and so these actors were a way in which I was able to do more with less uh, and had, you know, one actor, that's a small image, I had one actor, you know, on top of the guard tower, one actor on the cliffside. And so Hamlet kind of keeps seeing uh, these different ghosts and following them uh, along the way and the audience follows uh, as well. Similarly, we use musicians to both create atmosphere, but also there's this kind of amazing Pied Piper phenomenon where people really will just follow the person playing the instrument. So often no words are necessary and the, the, uh, the troubadour, as it were, plays and the audience follows along. It also allows us to divide and create a surround sound. So each of these ghosts had their own musician with them uh, who was able to do a trumpet blast or a horn blast. Uh, to that end, I'm often working with instruments that don't need to be amplified, mostly wind instruments. Our music director is also a saxophonist and a composer as well. So we work with a lot of brass and wind instruments for that reason. As I mentioned, as we move throughout the island, the audience is taking different configurations, uh, and I'm uh, very convinced that the way in which we perceive something, uh, our physical relationship, distance, proximity, whether you're looking through a chain link fence or right next to the actor affects what you see, how you see it, how you feel, what you hear. Um, I think that's happening to us all the time and a lot of my mission is to get myself and others to pay attention uh, and to drop in this idea that seeing is not just something that happens to us, it's something that we're participating with and the idea that seeing is an act of creation. So a lot of the times I'm staging things in a way where the audience can't possibly see it all at once. Um, and initially that can be frustrating, but part of that is because one, it challenges you and encourages you to look above you, behind you, below you, and in the distance, because you might just be rewarded. So while yes, there's a scene happening right here in front of you, if you look behind you, you might notice that one of the Ophelias or one of the musicians is behind you or one of the ghosts is behind you. Uh, and it starts to create this feeling of being within a sphere of performance, which is just cool, but also uh, 
can help blur the lines between what's real and imaginary, which is part of my ulterior motive, is that in the world, as we walk through it, we might get more interested in what's happening above us, behind us, below us, in the cracks between things, et cetera, uh, and in this way become more engaged with our everyday experience. Um, this is also a great example of the sun conspiring in our success. It was not always a personal spotlight on Hamlet, but in this moment it was. And that's also been something that's brought both frustration and joy to me in doing this work, because sometimes you have the helicopter that goes by overhead during to be or not to be, and you really wish it hadn't chosen that moment. Uh, but at other times, uh, a shaft of sunlight comes through, a flock of birds goes by overhead, and the audience has this really incredibly visceral experience that this is a precious, unrepeatable moment that is happening only this way this once, which is always true of live performance. But I think we sometimes forget that when we're lulled into a bit of a coziness in our seats, able to lean back, cross our arms, go ahead and press me. But what happens when, um, when again, you can't catch everything, when things are happening all around you, uh, when you are enduring the cold and the wind, when you are having to get your heart rate going to walk up a hill, uh, or when that, uh, that eagle opens its, that hawk opens its mouth at the moment that Zeus begins to speak, and you're sure that that is part of the show, because in that moment it is. Uh, again, my hope is that in, in staging works this way and experiencing works this way, that we'll actually carry this with us out the door and into the world and bring more wonder into our daily life. Was that, is that bird a messenger? What's an what's a omen but a sign that we interpret? And what do we get to do as humans that is so special besides be meaning makers and be our own uh, do our own weaving of meaning making in our everyday lives. So my hope is these concentrated experiences through the show will help us do that in our living. Again, often very intimate spaces. This is in the cell house in the hospital in, uh, on Alcatraz. Um, and the audience was packed in there shoulder to shoulder to shoulder, uh, very, very, very tight. Uh, this is, again, one of those closed places where you can see the audience signifier sashes on their chests, uh, and that's how we knew who to let in and, and who to stop. Um, but you can also see the expressions on the audience's faces, which is something that's incredibly wonderful and also incredibly difficult for the actors sometimes because there's no hiding uh, from how people are, whether they're engaged or not. Uh, they're right there and vice versa, that it also uh, demands uh, a certain a a kind of presence from the audience as well, because you are right there. It's really happening in front of you, and there isn't the safety of the dark theater to hide in. Uh, so I think that it brings us into a closer, more intimate relationship between actor and audience. Uh, this is in the Industries Building. Um, I included this one just to remind me to say, uh, while I'm still very much telling the story of Hamlet, it's all Shakespeare's text, uh, we're very much committed to the psychological arc of each character. In the case of Ophelia, who's in the middle here, she is the main Ophelia who has the text and carries that psychological arc, but she also had five other women playing her fractured psyche, who sort of followed her around like a flock of birds. The island itself is a bird sanctuary, which again, what's in the way is the way. There was, uh, the parade ground is off limits to us for, till about two weeks before we opened, because it's nesting ground for seagulls, which I learned through my time on the island are essentially the white sharks of the aviary kingdom. They're really brutal and extremely territorial, and the parade ground became uh, truly something was extremely rotten in the state of Denmark. It was so foul and so much death and decay that it also became really useful because I would say, Ophelia, go take a look. This is what's happening to you. This is, uh, the birds are demonstrating what the powers that be in uh, in Elsinore are, are doing to Ophelia. And they also became the inspiration for this, this fractured psyche. So in this case, Ophelia's flowers were not the flowers. They were broken bones and bits of feather and bits of string. And of poor Ophelia trying to make a nest for herself out of the broken bits of her life uh, and of the island itself. Uh, this is a rubble pile on uh, Alcatraz. Um, this I encourage you as you do look more into Alcatraz's history, as Susan mentioned, the um, Native American occupation. Um, there is a very sad story connected to that. One of the leaders of that movement who was a real visionary, his young daughter died during the occupation and she fell from one of these buildings. Uh, and there's a lot of um, uh, question over the causes around that. It was an incredible tragedy and after that, Understandably, he did not have the heart to continue and left, uh, and left uh, a significant vacuum uh, where he was. And so this is where we chose to bury Ophelia, who similarly was an innocent uh, in a much larger um, 
more messed up situation. Um, and so this is where the grave diggers were and where Ophelia was buried. Again, some of those things are not explicit. There isn't a sign like in a gallery telling the audience in the moment that this is what this means. They'll only know that if they do their homework, if they read the program thoroughly. But I really believe that spaces hold memory and that we feel things from spaces, whether or not we're able to articulate them or verbalize them. So I really felt that this was energetically the right place for the scene and that the actor, if the actors knew that and we knew that, that it would communicate what we were intending, whether or not the audience actually ever knew that. That's Ross Travis being amazing. Um, and then a very iconic shot of, uh, of Alcatraz. Um, we did a number of visual art exhibitions in the gallery. Um, I'll scan through these relatively quickly. Um, this is by an artist, Evan Bissell, uh, who worked with incarcerated uh, children whose parents are incarcerated or were incarcerated to uh, work with them and developing narratives and then doing their portraits. This was the um, opening exhibit we did at Alcatraz. And then after a series of uh, many months and many, many signatures, we were able to get uh, an enormous amount of work released from the archives of San Quentin, um, and we did an uh, an exhibit on the island that was all of uh, for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated artists from San Quentin. Um, that was part of a symposium of works that we did out there. We also collaborated with a couple of choreographers to do a dance piece in the cell house, and those are image. These are images from that. Um, I'm going to move on because time. Uh, some, often I'll try to do sort of works that are their own productions, like Iphigenia was prior to Hamlet, The Odyssey on Alma, which was a sailing production aboard this uh, old boat, this old schooner where we sailed past our former stage to our upcoming stage, which was Angel Island, um, where this time the, the stage was moving because it was on a 50-foot boat, um, but the audience was not moving, the stage was moving, and so we would sometimes put the sirens and other creatures on land that we would sail by or have references to, again, here, Alcatraz as we sailed by, but otherwise the actors were amongst the audience on the boat. And this was a full-scale production, but also a study for what became an island-wide production of the Odyssey on Angel Island. There's the Cyclops in uh, the boat version. Um, that same actor up in the mast, again, trying to work with what the space allows. So here, because we were on this constrained space, the mast became the vertical space. So we put an actor up there as Hermes um, appearing from on high. Um, again, I'll move quickly through these photos. This is Angel Island. Uh, and that uh, perimeter route in gold that you see is the perimeter route around the island that you will walk some of or all of. Um, the uh, immigration station is roughly where the southern point of the rose, uh, compass rose is here, where Lenora's piece was. Um, and the piece that I did, uh, the audience, it was a six-hour production. It started on the boat. Um, the actors were waiting for them on the beach when they arrived. The audience is on that boat. Again, it was very interactive. So at various points, the audience is invited to participate here in a tug of war. Um, Again, working with distance and proximity. So one of the actors, one of the gods, is up the hill, barely in focus because he's rather far away, behind Telemachus. Telemachus is Odysseus's son, and we followed Telemachus around the island. So again, here's the audience following Telemachus around the island. Um, it was a long day. We walked about five miles over the course of the day. Um, and again, participatory and working with the backdrops of um, the Bay Area, which uh, could never create in a theater. So thank you, history and nature and time. Uh, again, more participation and oscillating between witnessing things, listening to things, and participating with them. Again, you can see Alcatraz in the background in the city, so just a sense of depth of field. And that's something I like to work with a lot is depth of field, putting an actor far out in the distance, or as I said, behind, above, or below. Similarly here, as you walk around the island, you'll encounter um, uh, the quarry, the rock quarry that provided an 80-foot cliff. That seemed like the obvious choice for Mount Olympus. So in addition to choosing the play and the place, I'm also there's Hermes arriving on a golden bike. He had lots of methods of golden transport from scooter to uh, bike and another I'll show you in a bit. Um, uh, briefly, I'll just share that, um, again, the most basic level of participation is the audience is on their feet following the show. There's these added levels of participation like you saw with tug of war and playing with the parachute. Um, but there's also choose your own adventure moments. So at one point we met Zeus at a crossroads and he said you could go one of three ways. You can only go one of three ways. You did not rotate through the three. You got that choice and not the others. 
so one route was to go this way with Zeus and cheer on the Olympians um, who went through what is now the Nike missile, what is the Nike missile launching site, which is a Cold War, Cold War era site um, that we turned into Scylla and Charybdis, um, which if you're familiar with the uh, myth, um, well, you can look up Scylla and Charybdis, they're wild, crazy beasts, and we turned that into um, an obstacle course that the audience went through. But for those who were tired, four hours into the six-hour ordeal, they went to have sacred beauties anoint them and sing to them in a cool uh, uh, chapel um, near the um, World War II era hospital barracks, which are these. Um, and I mentioned, again, um, sometimes there's these uh, participants from nature that we didn't hire but would like to, uh, there was for some reason always a raven that would be here almost every show. Um, and a raven in many cultures um, signifies death, not always, um, but was appropriate for this ritual space in the House of the Dead. Finally, we ended up at uh, Cory Beach, or Calypso's Beach, where Calypso and her jazz band were waiting. So we'd sort of alternate between these sort of intense, physically uh, intense experiences with ones that were more gentle, or things that were darker and more intense with things that were more joyful. Here's Calypso and Hermes again appearing on, uh, this time by sea, on his golden boat. Um, and so the audience is watching Calypso, but then they hear uh, Hermes trumpeters from behind them. They turn their heads to see that actually all the world really is a stage and that one of the actors is appearing uh, from the sea. Uh, from here, I'll, I'll wrap momentarily so that we can talk more. Um, but um, at that point, the audience continued and completed their journey. Um, again, the Odyssey is not specifically interpreting any one layer of Angel Island's history, which has the longest military history of anywhere in the Bay Area, 250 years of military history. Um, but it was a way of exploring the more central theme uh, involved with war. It was actually a staging ground for um, soldiers to leave for the Pacific Theater during uh, World War II. Um, these themes of leaving and coming home and the and uh, the Odyssey is, of course, all about leaving and coming home, and the idea that we have to leave home in order to find and develop ourselves in order to earn coming home. And so my hope for the audience was that walking five miles and enduring a six-hour day in heat and cold and various uh, weather, that they would be tired and hungry, and that their bed would feel all that more, much more comfortable, and food would taste all that much more delicious, uh, and that there is a way in which when uh, work and life costs us something and we lean in, that there are rewards. Uh, and so in a way, it's also a reminder uh, to be wary of things that are too easy, because often our learning and our growth comes from that extending out uh, into the unknown, uh, which I hope the Odyssey helped the audience have a real experience of, as well as a, a narrative journey through. Lastly, I'll say, since you are going to be working on Angel Island, if you're interested in finding out more about uh, the suite of visual art projects that we did um, on Angel Island, uh, throughout the island, and specifically in the visitor center at Ayala Cove, you can go to weplayers.org slash presenting series. And in the presenting series of uh, uh, section of our website, there's a, a suite of works that are not the large scale works, parties and concerts, and um, visual art exhibits, and there are several robust pages detailing uh, the half a dozen artists involved in each of those visual art exhibits on Angel Island. And if you're free this Sunday and not at Lenora's show, which you should definitely go to as your priority, but if you are free, aside from that, at 2 p.m. on Sunday, we're having a concert in the Shakespeare Garden in Golden Gate Park, celebrating 10 years since the Odyssey on Angel Island, and it will be all new arrangements of that score with a six-piece jazz band. Um, tickets start at $12, uh, and if that's an inhibition for you, you're also welcome to just come and help us put away chairs at the end. Thank you. I close this? Or leave it up? Okay. I'll sit on, on this side.
Well, thank you, Lenora and Ava, for wonderful talks. Um, and I think they're especially helpful um, as the students prepare, uh, many of them, to go on the field trip. Because I think what you've shown is that um, our experience of places and of stories is it's an act of our creation um, as listeners and as audiences. Um, and it's not a passive act. Um, and so I encourage students to, whatever you absorb from these talks today, carry that with you as you are uh, going to the immigration station because it's not, you're not going to look at things and absorb facts. You are going to have a bodily experience. Um, and I hope that the talks today um, help you think about how you might go about that. And I, I think I'd like to start by asking Lenora about, do you remember the first time that you visited the immigration station barracks? What did that feel like? And how did you go about transforming that experience into dance? I believe that one of the first time was in 2010, actually. Um, the Immigration Station Foundation was doing a commemoration, and so we had the opportunity to show a short excerpt of a different piece that we were working on uh, that was specific about my maternal grandparents' uh, immigration to the U.S. and their detention on Angel Island. Um, I think the, the way that they've reconstructed this station as a museum was... Um, and, and the exhibits that they have there are very moving, very touching. And um, there's a weight and a gravity to the experience as you walk through the station and you hear about the stories or you read about the stories and you realize um, really that this is this this was a form of incarceration, even though we don't talk about it like that. And that, um, you know, it's not really spoken about in history of the United States and that a lot of people just have, have no idea how, how difficult it was, I think, for Chinese during the exclusion era. So I feel that, you know, it's, it's been critical because I feel like a lot of the early, uh, the Chinese American history here in the Bay Area has, has deep roots um, through the exclusion era and, and um, many of the community members and family have been, that I know have been detained there and processed there. So it's part of, I would say it's part of the blood of the community that I've grown up through and um, has its foundations throughout, throughout the Bay Area and across the country. But, you know, really the detentions happened on the West Coast, not on the East Coast for the Chinese. And what was your process like? Did you sit in the detention barracks? Did you touch the railings? What, how does that work? Um, I would have to say it's, it's really witnessing the, mainly the barracks I felt like very moved by, but also viewing and reading the poetry on the walls and realizing kind of the depth of despair as well as hopefulness. It was a, a combination of things, I think, that people were going through. And I know that for my grandparents and that generation, you know, a lot of the early Chinese came over thinking that they would eventually go back to China. But then um, because of the exclusion era, they weren't able to bring family members over. So it became a bachelor society. And... I guess a lot of the experience in going there allows you to sit with um, the memories, the history, also everything that took place in that station uh, to give a, a bit of a glimpse. And when we did the performance there, you know, there were audience members who felt like once they stepped in, they could feel the gravity of it. You know, it's not that it's just a, a Chinese experience or Chinese American experience, but it was really, um, something that people could feel deeply, viscerally. They could um, get a sense of it by being there. And that's really, you know, the power of being in person, as you know, since we were unable to be together during the pandemic and trying to figure things out in a very isolated way. 
a lot of times visiting these historic spaces really gives you a sense of what occurred or you know a fraction of what occurred. And I think that's the power in creating work or creating experiences where you actually go to these sites and you hear for like you hear secondhand or thirdhand from um, staff members, you know, what the experiences were. But also, you know, there's a book, Island, and I think you may be reading that or have the opportunity to read that where all of the 200 something poems are in the book translated along with the history of Angel Island and the history during that period of time. How about you, Ava, and, and you might talk either about Angel Island or Alcatraz. You know, you do a lot of research, you do a lot of reading to get to know the place. How do you go about being present in the space and then transforming that into, into the theater that you create? Yeah, well, as Lenora was just saying, that the audience um, could feel when they went into the barracks something about that space. And that's what I was referring to when I was talking about um, the way that spaces hold memory. Um, and I think that we feel that all the time. Uh, and so for me, it's a lot of just different techniques to slow down perception uh, so that I can uh, listen to the space as deeply as possible. So maybe it sounds a little esoteric, but the practices are incredibly simple and you can do this anywhere at any time, really. A lot of it has to do with closing the eyes um, because as I mentioned before, it's something that we often think is happening to us. Um, and it's such a dominant sense for those of us that are sighted uh, that for me, closing my eyes and literally listening to the space and what's the farthest sound, what's the closest sound, then tuning in to my sense of smell, how my skin feels, what the temperature is like, then gradually bringing back my sight with soft focus so that first I'm just seeing colors and shapes before I start going in and then intentionally shifting to sharp focus, which is looking at one thing at a time. Um, I do a lot of research and that's to sort of do my due diligence. If Even if none of those specific histories get named or mentioned or, or discussed in the work, it feels like an important part of real land acknowledgement of trying to at least have some scraping the surface understanding of what actually happened in these places. And then of course, practically, it will help me figure out, well, what are the themes that move across these histories? I didn't know before I went out to Angel Island that there was 250 years of military history. I didn't know before I went out to Alcatraz about the Native American occupation or that it was a Civil War era fortress before it was, uh, that it has a long history as, um, as a, penitentiary uh, before it was a federal penitentiary. Uh, so that research will kind of help me understand the space, feel like I've done some modicum of respectful uh, work to approach the space, um, and then figure out what the themes are. That's the intellectual side, uh, but I get as much if not more from the kinesthetic or somatic practice of just physically being there. For me also, because I'm working in a lot of um, different parts of the island, I have to go to those different parts of the island and at different times of day, different times of year, feel the weather, kind of understand some of those aspects. So it's kind of a, a, a dance between those two things. And then of course I can't really get started until I have however many dozen actors and musicians on site. So I try to do a lot of that work beforehand. And then usually the first weekend of rehearsal is a micro version of that, a workshop for the participants uh, so that they have at least one day, one weekend to just do that sense work before they have to learn their lines and okay, now I really do need you to like say things in the right order and tell the story, uh, but try to give everybody at least a, an initial dose of sensory immersion. Yeah. Ava brings up um, a very good point about working in these spaces is that it is about immersing yourself um, initially with the space and uh, trying to be quiet and listening in a way that heightens all of the senses and as well as your sense of intuition. And I, I often find myself just asking the question, you know, what is a space? What, what needs to happen in this space? You know, what are the stories that need to occur here? What, what can we, um, you know, as guests to the space, uh, bring out to the forefront for people? 
And I think, you know, just as you in your daily lives have to ask yourselves, you know, when you're faced with decisions to make or how you might want to create something or develop something, it's like trusting that sense of intuition, but knowing that it's not just you, knowing that you're working with, you know, layers of history, you're, you're, <laughs> you are the DNA of your ancestors. There are things that are passed down to you that you have inherited. And so it's understanding that we're... We come from generations, there are generations that come after us and that we're working in a specific period of time, but that we can, you know, really listen and tune into and be able to access and ask the questions and know that it's not that we're stepping in, we're taking over, we're using these spaces, but it's really understanding that we are guests in these spaces and that we want to, of course, be as respectful as possible, but also, um, highlight the history, highlight what's occurred here as well through the process. Um, yeah. And I think we have uh, time for uh, one or two questions. Do we have any questions? None from the, the Zoom audience. Add a little detail that, um, yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, hi, my name is Lyon Kamsen, and I'm a fourth year, and I'm actually, like, a playwright for, like, the Filipino Cultural Night um, at UC Berkeley. And I was wondering, like, Lenora, you kind of touched on it earlier, but just, like, you said, like, the act of performance, like, is political, and uh, I was wondering how you guys kind of like narrowed the vision for your shows and like the representations that you wanted to present in your art and how you guys went about deciding that process. Um, usually for the performance projects we work on, we have to fundraise two or three years in advance. And so we'll come up with different ideas um, that we want to work on in order to write grants and do do additional fundraising. So the strategizing happens years in advance, and I would have to say that there are issues that I feel um, are part of uh, that are pressing that I'm interested personally interested in finding out more information on. So the the issues we've dealt with are you know historical immigration issues and current day immigration, incarceration, deportation. Um, veteran stories, the violence of war, of violence within the military. Um, and there are similar themes throughout, you know, but I feel that um, every year we have to, because of the grant cycle, <laughs> we have to produce new projects. And that's really hard, but uh, also good, you know, that each project has a short lived life span. And so that's why. Um, the beauty of live performance is if you're there to witness it, great, but then it's gone. So we try to document as much as possible. We're actually working on an archive for the Within These Walls project. Um, there's a scholar at UC Irvine who's putting together an archive for that project. And I wanted to say that um, we're restaging Within These Walls here at, at UC Berkeley on Cal Dance students. Uh, so we're starting, yeah, we just had auditions last week and we're starting rehearsals next week and it will be performed in February like the 23rd to 26th of February at the, the Playhouse here. So we're excited to put it on a singular stage. I think at, you mentioned intuition as another sense, which I love and feel very strongly about also. And I think it actually does connect to your question as well of like, specifically, you've got all this great content, but you've only got so much time. You know, you're trying to shape the thing with the beginning, middle and end, just like any essay that you might write where there's too many words at first and then it's a process of editing. Editing is your friend. One of the brain's most important jobs is choosing what to forget, so there's new space. So I think a lot of times in the beginning, there's this wonderful time where yes is the answer to everything. And then as you get closer to your deadline, whether it's a due date for uh, an essay for school or a performance, uh, you suddenly sharpen your sort of discernment and become a lot more willing to get rid of things. And as Lenora was saying about intuition, a lot of times for me, it's about 
finding ways to quiet the other voices, which are so loud, and get to lead the way through the world most of the time, uh, so that they're not making all the decisions, especially when it comes down to if you're having to choose whether to cut that phrase or that beat or that moment, that it's a conversation not just between your mind and the project, but the in intuition and the project. And anything that we can do to strengthen that muscle uh, because our senses are muscles that need to be exercised as well. And when we don't work them, they atrophy. As Lenora was saying about intuition, it's something that we have to learn to listen to, learn to trust so that we notice it when it's talking to us. And it will help guide us um, often better than, than, the, than the, is often a helpful ally. <laughs> Great. Well, I think that that is, oh. We'll just have one question from the Zoom audience. Okay, a quick question. Um, Catherine on Zoom says, I wonder if you've ever felt in a place too uncomfortable to work there. Has the place rejected you? It's incredibly painful to work in some of these spaces. Um, and I think that I don't know that I've ever backed down from a space once committed to it. Um, but I think it goes along with some of the stuff I'm saying about finding your way home um, uh, to yourself. Um, because a lot of times, I mean, the first time that I went to some of those spaces on Angel Island or certainly Alcatraz, the first time I went up into the hospital, I literally could not breathe. Uh, and it was so intense and so painful and I had to get out of that space. And that's a really important question because it's a really important question to then ask myself, can I do this? Should I avoid this space? Is this intensity of this reaction the reason to do it here? If so, what do I do to support myself, to shore myself up so that I can take care of the other people I'm bringing in? So, you know, like all of this, it's case by case. We're changing all the time. Our relationship to spaces are changing. So I think it's that constant process of evaluation and self-evaluation because in a lot of spaces, a lot of these sites do have really incredibly loaded histories. And like in Lenora's work, going right into those specific stories, it's painful. And so making sure you have ways to dance and laugh and take baths and whatever it's going to be that's going to bring you back home. Um, we, were, we had been trying to do a performance on Alcatraz for several years. Um, and so it didn't happen, but we did uh, shoot some video and film there that's in, in the current project that we're performing right now. And there were multiple times when I went out there and I just needed to be on Alcatraz and get a sense, is this, is this the right thing? You know, do I really want to do a project here? Because like, uh, because it is so weighted and so heavy and there was so much history there of, um, a lot of tragedy and, uh, very, very intense stories. So, um, I'll go to another project just briefly. The project that we did on veteran stories and violence within the military, while um, I didn't feel that I needed to step out of the location we were in, which was at Fort Mason's General's residence, we put it in there. But the subject matter was really, really challenging and difficult. The more research that I did about the backlash women received for reporting assaults within the military and how hush-hush that is, um, because of the uh, retaliation that they faced uh, was heart-wrenching. And I it was so difficult to bring those stories out. And people actually walked out of the, the piece because it was it was really loaded. And I think it's a very touchy subject, but 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 it is important to bring out and it is important to um, give voice to that. And give voice to the fact that so many women, you know, do not step forward and do not report it because of that, because of the fear of retaliation. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. And I just want to say thanks for for a lot of insights. And some of the takeaways that I'm getting are if a place or a topic challenges you, it's worth the effort. Um, and use your intuition, use your senses. Let's do that when we go to Angel Island tomorrow and when we do our other explorations this semester. Um, look forward to Ed Tepborn from the Angel Island Immigration Station uh, next week is our speaker. 
and I just want to say huge thanks. Uh, please join me in thanking Lenore Lee and Ava Roy. Thank you.